Welcome back to Untaming Masculinity, the podcast where we tackle issues relevant to men and their journeys to reclaim their masculinity. I'm Dan, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host and good friend, Brad. What's up today? Not much, man. It's, uh, it's early, so I'm still in the wake-up mode, but life is, life is good over here. How about you? Good. I got to, uh, it's interesting, so you know my girls are getting a little bit older. I had to chaperone a trip to a carnival last night and uh, keep an eye on five 13-year-old girls while not completely being overbearing. <laughs> And one of that them sounds like <laughs> one of them met their boyfriend there too, which their mother doesn't know about. So this Wait, is a, your girl. Has no, a no, no, no. Oh, one okay. of my one of my daughter's friends has a boyfriend from a different school, and they met and were spying on them all night. It was. Uh, nice. I'm not ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> good. So, good luck. Yeah. Anyways, so today we're joined by a special guest, Mr. Sam Ayers. He spent his early life wearing three-piece suits and driving convertibles in L.A. and decided to trade them all in on a whim for a Wrangler's boots in a pickup in Montana. When he's not forging knives and working on his homestead, he is the charismatic host of the outdoor podcast known as Wild Initiative. I don't know about charismatic, man. (laughs) You might be overselling it there. (laughs) No. Take a compliment where you can get it. (laughs) Welcome to the show. Thanks, man. I'm uh, excited to be here. It's always nice. Being on the other side of the mic because all the all the pressure's off now. I I can ramble about all the crap I want. Well, good. We want you to ramble. So, <laughs> why don't you uh, why don't you spend a few minutes telling the guys a little bit about yourself, kind of your background, and and where you got to where you're at today? Yeah, man. Um, my name's Sam. Uh, I run the Wild Initiative podcast. It's it's a podcast. It's a lifestyle brand focused on the outdoors, hunting, fishing, conservation of of all sorts, whether it's, uh, you know, backcountry elk hunting solo with your bow, uh, you know, um, Cape Buffalo hunts in Africa or sitting in a tree stand for whitetail. I I'm obsessed with all of it. I absolutely love all of it. And I want to share that with other people. Uh, I'm an adult onset hunter. I didn't start getting into hunting, getting involved in it until I was in my thirties. And so that's kind of where my passion lies is for other guys. Cause you know, as dudes, we can, we can get a little chesty about stuff now and again. And it's especially with things like cars and hunting and, you know, these like masculine things that we should, you know, we feel like we should know about whether or not we actually should know about them, whether or not we were raised in it or taught that, um, we feel like we should know it. So a lot of time is hard for guys to ask those questions, right? Like to reach out to someone and be like, Hey man, I, you know, I'm like 36 years old I, when I started, you know, I'm like, I'm 36 years old and I don't, I don't know anything about hunting. Like you, you like teach me <laughs> it's, it's sometimes it's a little embarrassing to ask those questions. And so, uh, I like playing that role of asking a lot of the dumb questions, even with stuff that I already know. Um, you know, we talk about out calling and I ask like from the basics, like from the, I, I don't even know what this, this little piece of tape with some latex in it is. Um, and so that's kind of the basis of my podcast is sharing that with other people. I mean, I grew up, I grew up in Southern California. I mean, I was born in Long Beach, grew up in Orange County, like going to the beach every day. Um, I, you know, I got into advertising. I was, I wanted to be like the quintessential, like ad agency guy. I was wearing the three piece suits. Like you said, you know, I, I had my little two seat roadster convertible that I, I, I'll admit, I still kind of miss that car. Uh, that was fun. That was fun to drive. Um, but you know, I, I wanted to, I had zero desire to leave LA. I wanted to live in the uh, penthouse apartment and, and work in advertising, be this high powered ad exec. And, um, you know, I, I wouldn't quite say it was on a whim. It wasn't necessarily ever a light switch moment, but I, uh, you know, over the course of maybe five, six, seven years, um, I started gaining interest and, I, I basically, I started growing up is a lot of what it was and started gaining interest in different things, meeting different people. And that then slowly turned into uh, now I'm this like bearded tattooed guy living in Northern Montana, 40 miles from town with 30 chickens that I was just checking on this morning. And I hunt and fish and run my own podcast and work from my own business. So it's uh, definitely a slight change, slight change. That's awesome. The question I have is how how did an interest in conservationism and the outdoors and hunting how did that start to get planted in you growing up in Southern California in that scene? 
So it's it's kind of a weird story. Um, you know, I mean, I I grew up in a super conservative family, and so if I had gone to my folks and uh, told them, "Hey, I want to start shooting guns," or uh, "I want to start hunting," or uh, all that stuff, they would have been like, "Okay, let's figure out how to do that for you." Like my parents were always very supportive in that, um, but it was never really anything that I, I I never had that prompting when I was younger, and so. I mean, I grew up fishing, camping, but it was like the summer vacation thing. We did it for like a week or two during summer vacation. And so, um, but you know, I, I was familiar with guns. Like I had no problem with guns and, but uh, I went to a bachelor party, uh, and we went to the gun range, the, you know, if, if anyone's been to Vegas and been to the gun store or, uh, been to top shot or these spots where you go and you sign up and you can buy a package and you can shoot big, big old pistols and fully automatic rifles and chain guns and all kinds of crazy shit. Um, well, I went out and I shot really like really shot a pistol for the first time. Like I'd shot 22s and stuff before with like my brother, but this was like really shooting for the first time. And I was like hooked. I went home and like a month later owned my own gun. (laughs) Um, and my buddy found out that I was into shooting uh, you know, that's all he knew. And he was doing this thing for his birthday. He's like, Hey, there's this like rifle marksmanship class where you can camp out and you learn how to shoot. Would you be interested? I'm like, hell yeah. So I went and bought a rifle, went did this weekend course, fell in love with that. And so then I started volunteering to help teach that course. Um, I went through it a couple of times, then, you know, started teaching with it. And I got really, really involved in teaching that. That's what a lot of my tattoo, my tattoo sleeve is. It's about guns and freedom and America. Uh, um, it actually like, believe it or not, there's a, there's a little hidden spot on my, on my arm that says Murica, M U R I C A. Um, yes. I told my tattoo artist, he had to hide it in the tattoo somewhere, but I digress. Um, but I'm the kind of guy, so I'm the kind of guy, like I can't do something. Um, I can't do something unless there's a larger meaning into it, especially like once I've, I don't want to say mastered what I'm doing. Cause I, I'm not like a master rifle marksman or anything but i got good enough to where punching paper just wasn't satisfying anymore i'm like i could i i could take a vintage rifle out to 600 yards and ring the steel on nine out of ten shots every single time um so it just was losing interest for me and i'm like i need something if i'm working out i need to be learning a skill or training for something if i'm shooting i needed to be either learning that skill or I needed to be using it for something more. And so I started looking into hunting. I was like, okay, this is like the next logical step, right? Um, you know, punching paper, then shooting, moving things. Uh, um, <laughs> I, so I started looking into it and just getting interested, getting involved. I was stumbling my way through it. I had no idea what I was doing. I ended up at a Bass Pro Shop and I was just looking at the bows and man, they saw a sucker a million miles away. They sent over like the pretty, like you know, skinny blonde sales girl. And before I knew it, I blacked out and woke up in my truck with like a $600, you know, I mean, I got out pretty cheap comparatively for how much bows cost, but like six, $700 worth of a bow and arrows. And, <laughs> and then I didn't touch a rifle for like three years. Um, I shot a bow growing up as a kid and I, I was obsessed with it. And really um, I started, I was in the middle of Los Angeles at the time. And I was like, well, I got to find somewhere to shoot the bow. There was a, an archery range, an outdoor archery range about half an hour away from me. This is in LA. So it was a half an hour when I drive out there at about four or five in the morning. It was about an hour and a half when I drive back just before work. So I would a couple times a week, like three, four times a week, I'd drive out at like four or 5 a.m. to go to the archery range, shoot for an hour or two, drive ha- an hour and a half back, shower, get ready for work, take the metro into work in the morning. That's what I did every day. The days I wasn't shooting, I was going up to Griffith Park and I was hiking the fire trails up there. Uh, I was working with a trainer multiple times a day so I could get fit for hunting. And, uh, you know, that's really what started me off into it. Um, You know, it was just that, that weird kind of transition from the guns to the bow to uh, the obsession. Yeah, I grew up in kind of the same family where we were conservative, we were lived in, you know, the, the outdoors were part of our life, but it wasn't necessarily something we did. So I grew up on a lake in Massachusetts. Uh, my dad was a, a largemouth bass fisherman, but it was kind of just a, a thing we did. It wasn't like a, a big thing. 
what do you really think it is that's that's drawing a lot of men in their mid thirties, you know, early forties towards the outdoors, towards hunting? What do you think? There's something other than just seeing, you know, the Cam Haynes and the Joe Rogans of the world on social media, you know, kind of making this so cool. I mean, without a doubt, social media has had a huge effect on this. Like we talk about this a lot in the hunting space where hunting media has changed. It used to be like to see hunting media, uh, you had to like send a pre-addressed stamp envelope with, uh, you know, with a check in it to this and you get real trees, monster bucks, edition one or two, three, you know, and it would just be like this thing of, of kill shot, kill shot, kill shot. Hunting media has changed now and there's more stories out there. It's more accessible. Everyone can see it. So without a doubt, you know, I mean, Joe Rogan's probably had more effect on the hunting industry. Like Joe Rogan, um, Steve Rinella, Cam Haynes, these guys that have this reach that's just beyond the immediate, like, I just want to see kill shots, hunters. Like there's without a doubt that has had more effect on the hunting industry and the outdoor industry than than anything else. I mean, that combined with all the shit that's been going down over the past few years, like with, you know, COVID lockdowns and um, just all of the the scarcity and things like that. People are realizing that they're not as capable and they're not as uh, prepared or uh, as they should be. And Mm -hmm. I think a lot of guys are realizing like, shit, man, like I can't take care of my family. I can't take care of myself, you know, um, if this happens again, or if this happened for longer, I'd be screwed. And, you know, uh, hunting isn't necessarily immediately the answer to that. I mean, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, if you get really good at tanning hides, you got yourself some reusable toilet paper, but, um, you know, it, it, I think there's an aspect to hunting, which it's, uh, there's that desire to be self-sufficient and be capable because within hunting, there's so much involved in it that, that then to some extent applies to the rest of your life and affects the rest of your life. And it's, you know, uh, mental, mental toughness, physical fitness, um, just the ability to think critically and in these high stress situations, they say, um, they, I, I can't remember. I, I have to find the study again. Somebody did a study and it's like they were looking at like high performance athletes and like when, you know, how high they can get their heart rate when they're like, you know, performing, I guess when somebody's in like a tree stand and the, and they just hear the sound of a deer, um, their heart rate goes up higher than anything, than the, than their highest, like physical performance. It like spikes up higher than that. And I, I swear somebody did a study. I might get called, somebody might call bullshit on me, but I have to go find this study again. But it's, uh, I mean, being able to perform under a situation like that, they call it buck fever. They call it, you know, elk fever, whatever. It's basically the idea that you black out. You probably like a lot of guys don't ever remember the shot they take. Um, you basically like black out during that. You're so like amped up. You don't remember any of that. And it takes a lot of folk, mental focus and strength and control. Slow your heart rate down remember that whole squeeze of the trigger or that whole pull of the release for your bow and watch where that arrow goes, watch where it strikes. Because so often last thing you remember is sighting in on that animal. The first thing you remember after that is watching it take off. You don't even remember where it went. Like there's a lot of stuff there. I think that applies to the rest of our lives. Um, and I think that's what it's that primal idea that 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 wide birth of applicable skills uh that really draws men into it i think that's cool because as you were walking through that that particular scenario of when buck fever hits there's that's kind of a microcosm of of life as men what do we do in terms of preparation to get ready for moments like that and preparation is something that most men seem to chase for a long time and here's a question i've got for you in thinking about that how do you feel that your hunting journey over the last few years has made you a better man, made you made you more masculine, if you will? Shit. Um, how has it made me a better man? I mean, I think uh, it, similar to what I was talking about, it's, it's made me more capable, significantly more capable. Um, if you look back, I mean, just 10 years ago, I have, the, I have these two pictures. 
I bought uh, when I was living in LA, you know, my folks lived up in Northern California and I used to, I, I love the town they live in. I make, but I would make fun of their little redneck town. And uh, I, I went up and I went to the local tractor supply and I bought like the most white trash, like cut off sleeve pearl snap shirt I could find. My mom hates it. So I'd wear it around. <laughs> But I look back and I've got two pictures. I, both of them, I'm wearing a pair of jeans, pair of Wranglers, and that redneck cut off shirt, tractor supply hat. You look at one, like I'm this little skinny stick figure, man. And I mean, I'm still not a giant guy, but you look at the second one and I look pretty jacked. Like it's, it's, and it's not even like, it's not even that like shirtless, like super noticeable. But you just look at the difference and you look at those two pictures and you instantly you're like, that dude is capable. That dude can handle his shit. This other guy, yeah, it looks like he's going to get blown over by a stiff wind or, you know, um, that alone, like it's taught me and I still struggle with it. It's But it's taught me a lot of discipline in my life. Um, it has uh, it has given me something to work at. And this is going <laughs> to. I really, I really got to figure out a way to phrase this so I don't sound like a total arrogant douchebag. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm not used to being bad at things. Um, like a lot of shit comes easily to me. I will admit that. Like I have a brain that picks things up quickly. Um, if there's a process, I can figure it out. I'm really bad at hunting. <laughs> like I'm, I'm not good at it. I've been doing it. You know, I mean, like five this season will be five years really since my first hunt i don't i don't count sitting in a tree stand in mississippi with my ex-girlfriend's family necessarily as my first hunt i didn't i don't know i was just sitting there i wasn't really doing anything um but this is coming up on five years i believe since my my first real hunt and it is questionable my levels of success i mean i've gotten stuff you know you see i got shit hanging here on the walls behind me um but like if you look at my first deer right here that thing's teeny like that's like <laughs> <laughs> that was like a one year old deer with like spike, you know, spike antlers and velvet. But I mean, I'm stoked on it. That was my first that was my first kill with a bow. I've got my turkey. I've got my audad. I've got my elk in the other room. So I have seen success, but like I'm not killing shit every year. It's just not happening. Um, I'm trying to get there. But all this to say, um, it's taught me to work at something. Um it is, it's something I'm excited about and want to do and want to prove to myself that I can do. Um, but I'm not good at it. Like, you know, it's not something that I just like picked up and I'm like, yep, I'm instantly fucking awesome at this. So I'm going to, I'm going to go kill it every day. Like, no, I've had to, I've had to accept failure in my life. And when we're not confronted with that as men, like, and then it happens that can fucking destroy us. Right. Like if you've never really had to, um, had to face failure and encounter failure in a lot of like smaller ways in your life and in ways that don't, you know, don't like completely derail your life. When those things that do completely derail your life, when you lose a job, when, uh, you get dumped, when, you know, uh, I think, you know, something happens with, with your wife or whatever, uh, you know, or there's like a big sickness in the family and you can't, you know, that's not something you can win at. You don't know how to, you don't know how to react to that. You have no practice reacting to that you have no, no prior reference in what to do in this situation. Um, and hunting teaches you a lot of that. Like anybody, any Anybody that's been hunting for a while will tell you they probably they see more failure any given day than success. I mean, archery elk hunting, for example, it's generously a 10% success rate. I mean, think about it, like only 10% of people every year that chase an elk with their bow at most, or it's probably more like 8% are successful. Um, and somebody put it this way. They're like, okay. You have like a 10% success rate. That includes dudes like Joe Rogan, Cam Haynes, John Dudley, Steve Ranella. So if you're not any of those guys <laughs> and like you, you probably got that like yeah. 5% <laughs> left, you know, <laughs> and 
Uh, so you're going to see a lot of failure. And it took me four years to kill my first elk. And that's like really good. <laughs> like uh, for, for going solo as much as I, I mean, I've pretty much hunted solo self-taught, you know, I've learned from a lot of people, but like, trust me, I've seen failure and it, it's hurt a lot, even just in the space of this hunt of the hunting space. It hurts because you, I mean, especially like when you're doing these backcountry hunts, like, you know, there's some guys where it's just a matter of course, like it's their property. They go out and this is not me at all talking down about like whitetail turkey hunters because I love it. I love doing that as well, but it's a different experience. Like, yeah, you invest in it. You build food, food plots, you hang your tree stands, you do your scouting, but there's something different than literally dedicating your entire year to training, planning, e-scouting, scouting on foot, uh, set, you know, setting up trail camp, doing all of this stuff, dedicating your entire year for this, these like two months, you know, come like mid August to mid October, um, to, to kill an animal, like to do that, all of that, spend all of that money. If you're hunting out of state, I mean, you're spending anywhere between, you know, 750 to, to $3,000, and then to go out and to drive back with uh, nothing but what you came with, maybe probably less than what you came with, that'll fucking tear you down a couple of pegs, bro. Like yep. that'll take you down a couple of notches. Yeah, the the struggle and you know the the doing hard things is something we talk about a lot on the show, and it's it, it's important for men. And I think it also kind of goes back to why why a lot of guys jump into this later in life, or why we're seeing that a lot. You know, our society right now is is pretty easy. And guys, guys don't necessarily have to do hard things. So we find these things like hunting, like going on big fishing trips, that kind of stuff, backpacking, whatever, that are that are difficult and present that those challenges in our life that we may not be good at, that we may not even succeed at. You know, well, to your point. Here's the thing, man. Like, okay, you know, we we live these lives of yeah, comfort, like you're saying. Um, what you know, what decisions do you make on any given day? It's like, okay, am I going to wear the you know, if, if I'm, if I'm like really struggling, man, am I going to wear my, my birch barrel t-shirt today? Or am I going to wear my alpha bow hunting shirt or am I going to wear, you know, my, uh, whatever, you know, logo t-shirt, you know, oh, which, which ball cap am I going to put on shit, man? Do I want to, do I have time to make myself a sandwich for lunch or do I just like need to micro microwave a hot pocket? Like, you know, oh man, um, do I, do I schedule my doctor's appointment for, for Tuesday or Thursday? Like those are, those are like the epitome of the decisions we make on any given day. Like it does not often get, you know, occasionally, you know, okay, I got to figure out something pretty serious with my job or, you know, uh, having marital troubles, whatever. I mean, I wouldn't know anything about that. I'm the most single dude on the planet, but, um, I, you know, it's like, occasionally we'll have more important decisions. I mean, yeah, your house catches on fire. You probably got some effing decisions you need to make right there, but hopefully that's not happening every, every week for you. Right. Um, thing about hunting is your decisions matter, especially when you're backcountry hunting, every single decision you make matters. You're actually in a lot of places. You're taking your life into your hands. You're out there. Shit, bro. You're hunting Montana you're dealing with mountain lions, you're dealing with grizzlies, you're dealing with rocky, steep terrain. Um, you're dealing with all kinds of stuff. You know, you don't know, you know, the weather can come in come September, it can be 90 degrees, or it can be snowing, you never know. <laughs> like Montana's so bipolar, like from uh, all through spring and summer and fall, like, Winter is winter here. Like we get six months of winter and then everything else is just bipolar. It's not sure what temperature it's going to be. <laughs> so you hunt out here. Your decisions matter, like legitimately matter. They're important versus every day. Like uh, it, it really doesn't matter what shirt and what hat I put on, but I agonize over that shit some days. Like, like, oh man, like the green area or the black car heart. Oh shit! Man. These are the big decisions, right? No, it doesn't fucking matter. Ninety percent, ninety percent of as men of what we do, it seems like these days during the day, the decisions we make don't fucking matter. And I mean, I think, I think you know, we're probably talking to a slightly different 
audience of people than just your average man. And so, you know, we we do things and we put ourselves in places in life to to some extent where our decisions matter more. And especially if you've got a family, things like that. But like so many of our decisions just don't mean shit when it comes down to it. And we need to feel like we're making important decisions. Yeah. And when you're out in the woods and like your choice on how to react to a situation or where to go or what to do or whether or not, you know, this snowstorm's blowing in, do you weather it, stay out there and weather it out or do you go back? You know, that could be the difference between getting stuck out there and being in a dangerous situation, depending on if it's going to get bad, or that could be the difference between you sticking it out there and being successful on your hunt. And you have to make that decision. Like, is this going to get so bad that I'm going to get hurt, that I'm going to get stuck out here, that I, you know, something could happen? Or is this something I can weather and stick through it and exponentially increase my chances of success? How often are you presented with situations like that where the value is huge either way? It's either your life or your success in hunting or... But the negative is also huge. It's either your life or your failure in hunting. Like, um, you know, how many decisions do we get presented with in any given day like that? I'd say yeah. the, the, the other point to that, and it kind of ties in real nice, is that when I'm out hunting or fishing, when I'm on the, out in the woods or, or out in the lake or the river or the, the ocean, wherever I'm at, is I have to be 100% present in that moment. And I don't have to deal with any of the noise. I don't have to deal with, you know... In, in normal life, you've got the wife and the kids and the boss and and whoever else all vying for your attention. When you're out hunting or fishing and just kind of out in the wilderness, mm -hmm. it's it's a one one track mind. It's like I'm worrying about finding that deer, finding that turkey. You know, where are the fish? What's the weather doing? All that stuff. Just me and the one activity that I'm at, and it's the only time in life. And Brad, you can chime in here because I know you're you're got a, kind of a similar life situation where. I can be a hundred percent just present in that moment and not really worry about anything else that's going on in the world. And that to me is one of the things that really draws it to me because I can kind of, everything slows down when I'm doing all that and I'm just there and I'm able to enjoy that one moment in time, usually by myself and just the beauty of nature and just I'm done. And if I get something great, if I don't get something, I don't care. I will tell you, don't get involved in the hunting industry if, if you like that. <laughs> Um, because then you're, you've also, you almost feel guilty when you do that. Like, yeah. like, well, I should really be making some content and, mm. you know, I got to make sure I'm, I'm recording and, and cataloging this whole process because, you know, you can't just post one picture. You got to kind of share the whole. So that's, that's like, I always tell people, I'm like, you can enjoy hunting or you can be in the hunting industry. It's, there's no, a, believe there's me, a, if you saw me yeah. hunt, I'd be homeless. There's no reason for me to be recording anything. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, I, I get that. And, uh, I used to surf, you know, I mean, funny enough, I mean, I grew up in orange County. I didn't start surfing until I went to college, came back. And one of my college buddies that was, that was living, um, about an hour South of me, uh, he really got me into surfing. And so we'd go out. So, I mean, I didn't start surfing until I was an adult either, but I loved it. I was obsessed with it. And the thing I loved was similar to hunting was you had to be, you couldn't have anything else in your mind. Like it was one of those, those few moments where, um, you were, all the distractions were gone, but you were also completely focused. Yep. Um, you, you had to be completely focused on that next set. Cause if you weren't paying attention, you know, you drift in too much and you get tossed or you just miss out on getting to catch that primo wave. And hunting now does that same thing for me. Like you said, it's, you can go out and, you can have all of this stuff going through your mind. It's really easily like, trust me, I've been out on those days. And, uh, but the problem is when you're sitting thinking about life and all this, you're not paying attention to how you're walking through the woods. Um, you know, you're tromping along, you're not paying attention. You know, your hunt starts the second you leave your truck, your hunt doesn't start when you get to your area that you're going to start your glassing from, or that, that spot where you think the elk are, because I've been tromping into those, my hunting spots, so many damn times, so many damn times. And I'm just like, I'm, I'm like checking my maps on my phone or I'm like, I'm still half asleep or I'm grumpy because I don't know, some rodent ran across my face in my tent or some shit like that. Um, 
you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm irritable, whatever it happens to be. Uh, um, and all of a sudden I look up and there's an elk that I, that stands still just long enough to basically give me the middle finger and take off. Um, so many times that's happened. And I'm like, that was a gorgeous elk. If I'd been quiet, I could have shot that thing 200 yards from my truck. Like, come on. Um, and so having to have that focus is so critical, but you, and you can't have all this stuff going through. You have to stay focused. Um, if you want to find that success, I mean, there's this one time, man, I'll give you guys a, a hunting story here. I'm, it was a couple years ago. Uh, my first time really hunting Montana, we're chasing elk and, uh, we're I, the Royal. We, my ass is chasing elk. Me and my <laughs> followers on Instagram are chasing elk. <laughs> I'm bringing you all along with me on this journey. Um, yeah. So I'm out hunting elk. I, I had been struggling, man. I torn up my ankle. Like I hadn't broken in my boots. I had a new set of boots. I'm used to leather boots, which to be honest, a lot of leather boots, you can just kind of throw on and go. They break in pretty easily. These were synthetic boots. And, I did not break them in and I regretted that decision. So my ankle is jacked up. I've been hunting. I finally get into elk. You know, it had been years and I had never gotten into elk. Finally get into elk and I'm seeing them. I find this spot and I'm going after them and stuff's just happening. But like my, my inspiration, my energy, everything's renewed. Like I'm in this shit now and stuff's happening. Stuff's happening. And I'm starting to get frustrated again. I'm starting to get in my head. And so, um, it was like this this weird little area that was on the border of some some private land. And so you kind of had to it was like a horseshoe shaped where the the middle like the the middle part of the horseshoe was uh, 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 private land. So you had to go up like one leg of the horseshoe across and then the elk were on the other leg. And I had to get up there at a certain time because you only have the width of that horseshoe before they're back onto private to get one. And there was never any elk on the leg of the horseshoe. I would come in never once. In the, the week and a half I'd been there, never once had there been elk there. So I get up and I'm just, I'm discouraged and I'm trudging. Like I said, just dun, dun, dun. I'm looking at my maps on my phone. I'm like dicking around. I'm kicking snow. And I hear a, and I look up like 250 yards from me, big old satellite bull. Like, I mean, he was just kind of on his own chilling and he's looking at me, but he doesn't quite see me yet. And I'm like, shit, I think I just blew this. But so I get down and. Um, you know, he starts, goes back to feeding. I'm like, okay, okay. I got a chance, but I get down. He knew something was there and I, I start belly crawling. I mean, and we're talking through like 10 degree weather. I'm belly crawling through snow, you know, bare hands. I'm trying to get up to this thing and I get, I get in maybe another 25 yards and it looks up and it's just staring right at me. It knows something's there. Uh, so I just freeze again belly belly down hands and face in the snow because there's nothing around nothing around no but not even a bush and if i'd been paying attention i could have strategized this a lot better and gotten in a lot closer a lot sooner um but no i'm just dicking around on my phone like an a-hole <laughs> and you know again this would have been 200 yards from my truck i could have quartered this thing packed it out and been successful for that season um but, you know, it started feeding towards me and then it, you know, it never got any closer than about uh, 120, 150 yards started taking off across. I got some really cool video of the sun coming up behind it, like about three, three, four seconds of video before it caught my wind and just. Psh. But you've got to be focused, man. You've got to be present at any given moment because those are the moments that are going to stick with you um, on those years that you're not successful. Like, yeah, you're going to learn a lot of lessons and everybody, you know, every real hunter goes in knowing, again, we talked about that, those success rates, you know, you go in, the likelihood of success is low, but when you make those dumbass mistakes, the, that's what sticks with you on those unsuccessful season. It's a lesson learned, but you're going to kick yourself for years after. It doesn't matter how much success you find. You're still, I'm still going to be telling that story in probably 20 years because I was such a <laughs> dumbass. I'm like, I didn't need to look at my maps. I knew where I was going. I'd been there for a week and a half. Wasn't that big of a piece of property. Like, <laughs> but yeah, focus. Critical, Man. critical to find that focus. And it's one of the few places where you can, you can wash out that noise, but still have that that mission 
that importance, that, that critical importance that we need to do as men. That's so, that's so powerful, man. I mean, you think so often about this is a, this is life lesson. You know, we have to be focused. We have to be disciplined. We have to stick to our guns, but you very easily could have let a failure like that derail you. It draws me back to something that you said earlier. It just, it stuck with me enough that I wrote it down. It's like part of what keeps you going is that you want to prove to yourself that you can do it. It's that constant challenge. It's that constant looking into yourself and say, asking yourself that question of, am I enough? Can I do it? And the answers are resounding. Hell yeah. That's why you can have a shitty week and a half. <laughs> Here's that the experience. Thing, though. Keep coming back. Here's the thing though. That's not always the answer. And that's when shit gets hard. Cause I hunt solo a lot. One of the hardest things is hunting solo. Not because, I mean, yeah, there's added like benefits of having another dude there for calling and this and that. But like, it's not even because of that. It is because of the mental aspect. When you're there hunting with a buddy, you know, one of you is always going to be like, oh, oh man, come on, let's just, let's just hit one more ridge before we go back or this or that or the other. When you're by, my, by yourself, you always, that, that voice of doubt is so loud. And I want to say that the answer is, fuck yeah, bro, I'm going to get after it. I can do this. I'm a badass. But it, that is not always the answer. And one of the big thing, another big lesson I've learned from all of this is, you know what? Some days you're going to give up. You're going to, you're going to, and those days I consider it a failure. I don't consider it a failure if I don't come home with an animal. I, I set my measures of success in, in a way that getting the animal is, is icing on the cake. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the goal of a hunt. We wouldn't be hunting if we weren't trying to kill an animal. We'd just be bow hiking. Um, but I try and set my measures of success where I'm more successful than last year. You know, if I get closer in, if I get a better shot, if I get, you know, something that's a step up, a better lesson learned. Um, the only time I really consider it a failure is when I give up, when I make the choice, when I could have stuck it out longer. Um, and you know, again, I'm not talking about like, okay, shit, this blizzard's kind of getting out of control and I may not get home, go home, like <laughs> you know, go back to the truck. Um, but like those times when, um, you know, you're just discouraged, you missed a shot or you just completely blew something or you hiked in, man, dude, I've, I've done some gnarly hikes in like Colorado just about killed me. I don't know how I didn't get, uh, altitude sickness there. Um, but we've hiked in and you get in, like, you think this spot's going to be just like a war zone with bugling elk and you get in, you see like one cow the first day and then you don't see or hear a blessed thing the entire week. Um, those are the times if you're solo and you're like, I mean, oh, well, if you're not seeing anything for the entire week, you probably should have picked a different spot. But, um, again, those discouraging moments when you go home in that, that's a failure to me. Not not killing an animal, but that going home. The lesson I learned in all of that is you're going to have those failures. You just have to come back from them. You can't sit and dwell. You know, I mean, we feel like we should be fucking perfect as men and invincible and like so mentally strong, nothing can phase us. And, you know, we, we become victims of our own goals, if, <laughs> if we will. And when we fail in that, we let it just completely derail us. Like, you know, I went home, fuck, I'm a loser. I might as well just end the trip kind of a thing. You know, that's, that might be a little bit of hyperbole, but um, learning the ability to like forgive yourself for that and learn from it and then go after it even fucking harder. Gosh, that is like of all the lessons, man, probably all of these lessons we fucking talked about that you can learn from hunting. That is probably as men the most valuable, I would argue. Like, you, you can learn all of this other stuff in other ways, but like the ability to fail and then come back from it, you know, to the ability to you're on a diet and you know what? You fucked up and you, you had that pizza that you shouldn't have had or you had that bowl of ice cream to not, not say, well, I'm a fucking, I'm a fat fucking loser. So I might as well just, uh, you know, go get my McDonald's. But to be like, okay, I fucked up. Why did I fuck up? Okay, I'm going to eliminate that issue. I'm going to understand that it's probably going to happen again down the line. And not necessarily in this way, but in a different way. And so I'm going to be able to 
address that then it's not going to derail me i'm going to keep moving forward i think out of all the things i've learned and i i struggle with this so much still um i s- really struggle with it but i think that is one of the most important lessons i've learned throughout all of this throughout the whole hunting and outdoor and fishing experience yeah don't make the the failure the habit this is the way i kind of like to phrase that let's turn the tables here a little bit i've listen to your podcast regularly. And at the end of each episode, you tend to ask kind of the same question. Okay. So I'm going to ask you what, uh, you know, you, you meet a new guy who's adult onset hunter, just getting started. Where do you start? How do you get going? What do you do? First and foremost, I mean, like the basic tactical stuff, get your hunter safety. Like you can do 90% of on- online. And here's, so here's the thing. Here's, here's your, your little hunting life hack. If you cannot go to an in-person course, I would highly recommend going to an in-person course. Some are better than others, but you're going to make connections. You're going to learn a a ton. But if you're just unable to do that, hunter's training, uh, typically like hunter's training, bow hunter training, all of this stuff, 100% reciprocity across all of the United States. Some states allow you to do your hunter's training 100% online. You don't have to live in that state to do your hunter's training there. So if you find one of those states, and I I can't remember off the top of my head what they are, go online, do your hunter's training online, get your certificate. That hunter's training will apply to the state you're a resident in, your hunter's safety. Um, You can typically do the same with bow hunter's safety. Like I did mine online in Idaho. It applies to California, applies to Arizona, applies to Montana. Um, You know, that's your little life hack right there. But take do your hunter's safety. There's no reason to not do that now. You're going to find out a lot about getting into hunting just through doing that. You may decide that, fuck this, it's not for me. I have no interest in it. After doing that, awesome. You didn't go out and buy a $1,200 bow or a, you know, a, a, a full set of camo or all this stuff. Like You didn't do any of that, and you realize it's either for you or not for you. It's your first, your first step. Um, don't, don't, get, don't fall into the trap of thinking you need it, all the cool shit. Um, I mean, again... That's the downside of um, social media. You, uh, it's really easy to look at all this gear and be like, I'm not going to be successful in, until I have a full set of Kuyu or Sitka. Uh, I need a, I need a $1,200 Hoyt bow with a, uh, you know, a spot hog sight and like this high end release, you know, I'm going to need, uh, you know, th- I'm going to need this pair of like $700 boots and this and that good gear. There's certain gear that you need to invest in. There's certain gear that it's all about comfort. You want to invest in a, in a good weapon, a good weapon that shoots as good as you do. You don't need a $1,200 Hoyt bow. If you shoot for shit, um, get yourself a good, like low priced. You can get like a PSE starter kit for like under 700 bucks. I'm pretty sure. Um, that'll come with a case that'll come with the bow fully set up, ready to hunt. I think some of them even come with like a set of like six arrows. Um, that'll get you started. Don't fall into the trap of thinking you need all this stuff. Once you grow out of it, then upgrade it over the course of time. Go to Walmart, get the shittiest camo. I know most of the dudes that are really successful that I know hunt in solids. I mean, Jim Shockey hunts in a cowboy hat and a red bandana. Like, (laughs) you know, it's like the old saying, it's like our granddad's hunted in, in denim and plaid. Like the best camo you're going to get is sit down and shut up. Um, Like don't fall into that trap. And I fell into it. Like, I mean, I, and here's the thing as, as we have a little bit more expendable income, typically as adults, you know, when you're getting into it as a teenager, your, your income's probably a little bit more limited. A lot of the time you're getting it into, into it in your thirties. Yeah. You got a full-time job. Maybe you've got some savings. It's really easy to go drop. Like, 10 grand for your, all your hunting gear and get all the cool toys at once. But, um, invest in good boots. Um, you don't have to, but they're going to make your life a lot better. If you're going to invest in anything, invest in a, in a decent weapon that shoots at least as good as you do and get yourself a pair of good boots. You can figure out everything else. Packs are nice. Everything else is about comfort. Like you can go buy Walmart camo. It is going to be just as effective as any first light Sitka, Kuyu, uh, Scree, any of this gear. Uh, it just may not be as comfortable when it's pissing rain or you're tramping through the snow or whatever. And it's not like high end wool camo that's going to still keep you warm. 
you're going to have to deal with that. You're going to have to suck it up. Um, your pack, you can get an old school frame pack. You don't have to, again, spend a thousand bucks on a, on a carbon fiber frame, ultra lightweight, expandable pack with all the zippers and pockets. You may be carrying a lot extra weight. It may not have that nice padded belt and shoulders. Like you may end up hurting by the end of the day every time, but that's just something you're going to have to put up with. Expensive gear is 90% about comfort. It's not about functionality. Um, and then invest in the, depending on what you're hunting. Like if you're hunting out West, uh, shit, especially if you're hunting Arizona, invest in the best class you can afford. Um, binoculars, get yourself a good, uh, uh, 10 by 12 pair of binos, uh, to carry with you. Um, if you can afford like a bigger set for, if you're doing something like Arizona where you're glassing for miles, you need a bigger set. Um, those are the three things I would highly invest in, like in that order, weapon, boots, and glass, everything else, you know, make yourself a spreadsheet. Be like, this is my budget. Then add f- at minimum, probably double it. I'd say, um, if you're, if you're budgeting for your hunt, be like, okay, this is about what I'm going to spend on gas. This is about what I'm going to spend on food, travel tags, all of that stuff. Then look at your budget. This is what I got left for gear. Start with your weapon, then go to your boots, then go to your glass, then go to your pack. Then, you know, water filtration, camo, all of that crap. So that's your tactical shit. Like get out, get, get started, just get after it. There's ways to get started in hunting even cheaper, but I, I, I know we're kind of talking a little bit. I, this is my passion is the back country, like big game hunting. I'd highly recommend people just pick up a, a $350 shotgun, some Walmart camo and go sit in a duck blind or chase upland game. That's awesome. Like that's a great way to get started. You can get kids started that way. Um, but more, more from a mental aspect, be tenacious, be absolutely tenacious. When you go after this, the reason I've found so much success meeting people and getting into the industry and finding like the ability to go hunt is because I have chased it down like a motherfucker. Like I, I went and I would go, I would go to all the expos I could. Um, you know, I was living in Los Angeles at the time. I had LAX right there. Flying to Salt Lake City was like 75 bucks for like a round trip ticket. Uh, and not everyone can do that. Not everyone's in that situation. But like I went to every expo I could. I just went and talked to everyone. If you haven't told, one thing hunters love to talk about is hunting. Like they may not give you your, their spots, but they'll tell you stories all fucking day long. Um, we want to talk about hunting. We love to talk about hunting. So go after it. Talk to those people. Find them. I went to some random event in Salt Lake City. I needed to get out for the weekend. I was just like going stir crazy. And I was like, oh, there's this like little local event at, in Salt Lake City. And these guys are going to be there and they're going to do a hike and all this stuff. I went and everyone's like, you flew out for this? I'm like, hell yeah. And I met a lot of people and gained a lot of respect and a lot of credit. And a lot of those people, I was then able to call up. And ask for help, ask for advice on different things. Um, I, a few of them hooked me up with some with some gear. It was awesome. You know, you don't ever go in with that expect expectation, but it's nice when it happens. Um, so be tenacious. You know, we always say like, yeah, go to your local hunting shop. You know, there's always going to be someone there willing to talk to you. No, it's not always the case. Not everyone you go talk to. I mean, go to a local hunting shop. Don't go to like a, a Bass Pro or a Turner's or something unless you know you know the people there, but. Um, go to like a local small archery shop or hunting shop or outdoor shop and just hang out for a while, buy something, you know, buy some flies or something small, just, you know, you don't want to be, you don't want to be the a-hole that's just kind of coming in and hanging out all day, you know, buy something small. Um, but you may not meet someone the first time you go in, you may not meet someone the third time you go in, but if you go in on the regular, you make yourself a regular, you'll get to know the store owners. They'll introduce you to people. Like you go in, you talk to those guys for a while. They'd be like, Oh, Hey man, you need to meet so-and-so he's going to be in, in 20 minutes. Da, 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 da. You have to be tenacious. It's so easy for guys like, well, you know, I went to my local hunting shop and everyone was just like, nobody wanted to tell me where their, their hunting spot was. (sighs) Fuck bro. Like if, if that's, if that's all you got, (laughs) you're not going to make it when you're chasing an animal. Like go after, go after your desire to hunt. Like you would, like you expect to go after an animal, chase that shit down, figure it out, find every opportunity you can to interact with these people, 
reach out to them on social media. You never know. Like, I mean, I can't, I can't get back to everyone. And I, I like have a quarter of the correspondence that, that most of these guys do, but every so often, like you'll hear back, you send out 10 messages. You may hear back on one of them. You may hear back on five. Um, and I mean, I'm talking like message campaigns, message, uh, Jim Shockey message. Um, I haven't had much, much success getting Ranella to get back to me, but, um, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) <laughs> but you know message like ryan lampers all of these dudes you want to learn something they love it they can't again they can't always do that don't expect that but they love love hearing from people hearing about your successes hearing about what you're trying to learn what you're trying to figure out um you know and i think we talk about this a lot give as much as you expect to receive you know um I, we talk about this in in the ic uh you want to gain a bunch out of what you're doing in there. You got to, you got to contribute. Same, same when it comes to hunting, you may come in, you may not have much to contribute, but you can always find something. You can always find some, uh, some way to do it. Like if you can go in, you can talk to someone be like, dude, you're going on an elk hunt. I, I like, I'm, I'm not looking, I'm not looking to hunt. Can I just like help you glass and pack out? There's not many guys that are going to turn down an extra set of eyes and an extra, extra back for a big hunt. Um, I don't, I don't know of just about any guys that would, would turn that down like for free. Somebody that's not going to be like, they're not going to have to alternate the first shot with, but they're going to get a chance to, uh, have that extra back, those extra eyes. Not many guys are going to turn it down. You're going to learn about like how to stalk through the woods. You're going to learn how to glass. You're going to get a really big reality check on success. And then the work that goes into all of the hard work comes after the shot. Like everything before that's easy compared to then you've got this thousand pound animal on the ground or this 900 pound animal on the ground. You then have to spend a couple hours skinning it, quartering it. And then you have to put that shit on your back and walk your ass out. I mean, each of those quarters can be anywhere from 60 to 80, 90 pounds. Like it dep- and you've already got shit in your pack. You're five, six, seven miles deep. Hike that back to your truck. You can't just leave the rest of that meat there, unload that, refill your water, you go your ass back. It's always nice to have somebody extra there. You're going to you're going to get a reality check. Um so yeah, man, be tenacious. Give as much as you're going to get. Don't don't get uh don't get fooled into thinking you need all of the newest nicest gear. Um and you know, just get after it, man. It's like the only way you're going to do it is if you get out. Make that decision. And don't like, if you're listening to this podcast, you're like, you know, I want to get hunting. I'm going to start looking into it. Literally pull up. I'm just going to be quiet for like five seconds here. So you guys can pull up your, you know, your Google and just type in my, where you can take your local hunter safety. Do that shit right now. One, two, three, four, five. Boom. If you, if you can't find Google on your phone or your computer in that, in that (laughs) amount of time, I, I can't help you. Um, but no, like it's, it's a joke, but go fucking do it now. Like literally do it today. If you're listening to this podcast, go find your hunter's safety and figure out where your nearest like small hunting or archery or, or, or gun store is like literally in the next, within the next half hour after listening to this podcast, I want, I want you guys to go do this um, because it's too easy. You know, I always, I always refer to it as the, the paper on the floor syndrome. You know, we're walking around the house. And it's like, oh shit. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta toss that piece of paper that's like sitting on the floor. Then you walk by it. And then like a day later, you walk by it again. Man, I really gotta throw out that piece of paper on the floor. Why don't you just fucking pick it up right then and do it? Get if you wanted to hunt, if you wanna, if you wanna do hard shit, if anything we've said on this podcast has inspired you, go fucking do it today. No excuses. Do it today. So I, I kind of went off there a little bit. Wow. Nah, man. That was that was, that was awesome. I, lo- I loved it. And here's, here's the thing. I'm going to tell you very selfishly. I'm very, 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 very early on my hunting journey. And, you know, in the back of my head, there are always these thoughts jangling around that, oh, I don't want to have it. this imposter syndrome. I'm going to ask these questions. It sounds like a total dumbass. That inspired the hell out of me to just get after it. Put that stuff aside and just fucking do it. And I got to tell you, man, that, that little hint that you gave at the beginning – with the uh, the hunter safety out mm-hmm. of state and then coming back in, that's huge. I, my hunting journey was stalled for about two years because I didn't realize that. 
And it, like the courses down here on Long Island were filling up almost as, as soon as they were opening up. And it took me two years to get into a course. Whereas if I had known that I could take something online from Kansas and then just transfer it over, it would have been perfectly acceptable. So hundred percent reciprocity. Like there's no state that will not accept another state's hunter safety in order to get a license. That is absolutely huge. So thank you for that. Brad, you got anything else? Sam, thanks for taking the time to meet with us, man. This has been awesome. I'm, I'm fired up. No, it was a ton of fun, man. I'm glad uh, any any opportunity to talk hunting, a uh, great way for sure to start my weekend. I'm excited. You know, we got fall seasons coming up and I, have admit, I mean, honestly, fall season has started here in Montana. It's archery antelope started on the 15th and I have not even sighted in my new arrows yet. So <laughs> I think I think that is going to be part of the day today is I'm going to go out back to the range start flinging some arrows. You guys have, you guys have got me just as inspired. So, uh, I need to, I need to get some work done. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you joining us. It was a great conversation to the guys who are listening, man. Thanks for, thanks for listening. Make sure you come back next week. Check us out on Untaming Masculinity. You'll see all of our social media there, as well as links to, uh, to this and all the other episodes. Um, all we ask is that you go into your podcast player, leave us a rating and review that helps us get the word out. And other than that, come back next week and we'll leave you with just one question. What are you doing to untame your masculinity? 